Artificial intelligence and the legal profession. Um, Sean and Laura and I want to have a conversation with you that is going to attempt to answer three questions. Why, how, and what? The why question is why are we talking about this? We have so many things to talk about. There's so many things happening in the legal profession. Why are we talking about artificial intelligence? The how question is a little more practical. How is it going to affect us? Will it affect us at all? Will it affect our generation or the next generation? And finally, perhaps the most difficult question of all, what do we do about any of this, if anything? Laura's going to begin the conversation uh, with a video clip from a professor who is known as the godfather of AI. This is the biggest technological advancement since I think it's comparable in scale with the Industrial Revolution or electricity. Electricity. Or maybe yeah. the wheel. Or maybe the wheel. Yeah. Jeffrey Hinton is known as a godfather of artificial intelligence. For the last 10 years, he's helped Google create AI and mentor the industry's rising stars, including OpenAI's chief scientist, Ilya Siskova, and Nick Frost over at Cohere. In fact, Toronto is a global AI hub today in large part because Hinton moved here 40 years ago when the Canadian government agreed to fund his unusual research. I was kind of weird because I did this stuff everybody else thought was nonsense. While others pursuing AI tried to program logic and reasoning into computers, Hinton thought it was better to have them figure things out themselves. The idea was to mimic the brain. With lots of practice, these virtual neural networks illustrated here would make the right connections to solve a given task. There were doubters. The big issue was, could you expect a big neural network that learns by just changing the strengths of the connections? Could you expect that to just look at data and with no kind of innate prior knowledge, learn how to do things? People in mainstream AI thought that was completely ridiculous. It sounds a little ridiculous. It is a little ridiculous, but it works. This is like the most pointed version of the question and you can just laugh it off or not answer it if you want, but what do you think the chances are of AI just wiping out humanity? Can we put a number on that? It's somewhere between um, 0% and 100%. <laughs> okay. So I, mean, not I, think, I think it's not inconceivable. Okay. That's all I'll say. opinion is that the development of AI is of the same scale and magnitude in terms of human evolution as the Industrial Revolution, the discovery of electricity. Indeed, he mentions at one point the discovery and the creation of a wheel. So, Sean, let me begin with you. When I hear this, uh, it sounds like hyperbole to me. I mean, maybe it's not, and I'm in no position to be contesting, you know, a, a physics and computer scientist professor, but it does sound that way. Uh, you've got some experience in this. So tell me what you think. So I like the part of the clip where Jeff says uh, it does sound a little ridiculous. Even he realizes the absurdity of what's going on. Coming from him, though, he's not an exaggerator. And so this is the guy who would know. If, if there's someone who knows, this is the guy who would know. Well, he raises some existential questions that we're not going to be able to answer, but let's turn our attention to how it might affect lawyers. 
Laura, you have some, some research on this point. I do. Goldman Sachs, their economics team, did um, a survey, a study um, of which industries would be the most affected by AI, and the legal profession is the number two profession affected that could be automated by AI. That's second only to office and administrative support. Which is not who we're normally hearing about. We're hearing about programmers or doctors or radiologists. And architects. And they all like land that. in the middle of this scale. We're at the edge of the Correct. The, the legal profession is the number one learned profession that could be automated by AI. All right, let's get to some specifics. I have um, heard and read stories about the AI taking the bar exam. You've got some research on that as well, I think. Yes, GPT-4, which was released this past March, um, took the UBE, the Uniform Bar Exam, passed it with flying colors near a 90th percentile. Um, experts have also opined that this latest model of GPT could outpace junior associates in law firms. How has this evolved? Sure. Um, specifically with Virginia, also, um, we have the MBE component of the Uniform Bar Exam. And specifically on the MBE, as you can see, the, the green bar is GPT-4's performance on the MBE. The blue bar is the average student score. So it's outperforming the average student. And that last red bar, that's GPT-3.5. So you can see the progression of models. And that was only quarter one of this year. Correct. So quarter one of this year, GPT 3.5 would have failed the bar, and today it would pass. Yes. So in three months, I mean, how, is, how do you explain that? How is that possible? So the best way to understand this is the technological breakthrough has happened that people have been talking about for a decade. And so now it's just a matter of engineering improvements and we're on an exponential improvement scale because a former restraint has been removed and now we're on an S adoption curve which is exponential on the way up until we hit a new uh, constraint of some kind. Did you see this curve coming, Sean, when you were in the patent and trademark office? So, no, actually. Uh, I got hired at Heritage and Heritage to do exactly this. And uh, I was uh, an examiner at the, at the office and we were working on automation and everything was very incremental very, very step change kind of, or uh, incremental improvements. With this, they asked me when I got hired at Heritage, how long before we can input an IDF and output a patent? I said, we're at least 10 years away from that. Well, that was five years ago. Uh, I was off by half. And um, apparently a lot of people were. Yeah. And, uh, and so December of last year, I realized, okay, it's game on. This, this technology is available and it's ready. Laura, one of the things I asked you to do early on was to take an uh, exam question from the Virginia SA bar exam and plug it in and get an answer and then quality control it. Tell us what you found out. Yes, this is an essay from the uh, essay question from the most recent Virginia bar exam, February. Um, it's about formation of business entities, pretty simple, um, which business entity would be the most advantageous for the fact pattern. Typically, you have about 36 minutes per essay question. And um, as you'll see, I've demoed how fast GPT-4 can answer this question. I literally just copied and pasted in the essay question with the caveat that it should answer it using exclusively Virginia law. So we're actually watching this in real time in terms of as you did it before. Yes. At the speed at which it I've replied. I've not sped up the video at all. Okay. It takes about 45 seconds to answer the question. So it cycles through the different entities, business entities. It compares and contrasts the differing associational responsibilities of the entities, the way profits and losses are accounted for. It goes through the liability models for each of the different entities, the very things that we study for hours and hours and hours to prepare ourselves for to answer well on the bar. And it what people most usually think when they think this, when they, and the thing that I, th I thought when I first saw it, things like this, is, okay, great, it just searched the internet and found a document that um, was what you needed, like Google. It's not. It's actually performing analysis at each word. So each word is informing, okay, what's the most likely next word? And as a result, it's performing an analysis just like a person would do, and it's doing a, a synthesis of everything that it knows. Okay, this is where, Sean, I think we need a vocabulary lesson because I keep reading that the difference is, as you seem to allude, you know, Google is finding, capturing, 
doing a little bit of analysis, distinguishing, but not creating or generating. Right. So take us through some of these uh, vocabulary words that we've got to at least have a little bit of a grasp on. Right. I mean, you're, no one's going to wrap their mind around this in, in a few minutes, but let me, let me uh, give a high-level overview. What we're hearing more about now than any other thing is generative AI, AI that's creating content, not AI that's sorting. I mean, uh, Facebook's been doing that kind of AI for a long time, suggesting those kinds of AI. That's, that's not the, the, the recent breakthrough. The recent breakthrough is creating new content that is a synthesis of known content. Uh, so that's generative AI. Generator, generative pre-trained transformers, GPTs, are the breakthrough that made this possible. Now the breakthrough honestly happened a few years ago, uh, but it took until now to get it to the point where it's as smart as a person at doing a task. And that really is the watershed moment when you realize, okay, wow, this is different. Uh, large language models are one type of a GPT. Um, uh, large language models often use a lot of GPT, uh, generative pre-trained transformers. Natural language processing, huge field. It's just computing language. Uh, we won't even touch on quantum computing, Judge. That would be an entire another presentation. Um, all these are machine learning. Deep learning just means it's a really big model. Uh, neural networks is the, if you saw in the video a few minutes ago, it had the, the, the circles with the, with the weights connecting the different nodes. That's, that's what a, a neural network is. The goal was, can we copy what's going on in the human brain? Hallucination. Who's heard of a hallucination? If you've raised your hand in, in the audience, if you've heard of, of, of AI hallucinating. All that is is it made something up. It didn't know the answer to the question, so it made something up. Uh, AI models have been trained to answer the question at any cost. So wait a minute. Let me, let me pause for a second. We're not going to get go down this rabbit hole too far. So it's trained to not say, I don't know the answer. No, because no one on the internet says, I don't know. They say something. Okay. So if this is a representation of the human species writ large, uh, I'll go on that other subject. <laughs> so, um, Laura, at the very bottom of this slide, I see some hyperlinks, and throughout this entire presentation, there are dozens of them. Can you tell us what use they are for us? Yes, there's just more information about these terms and the sources that I have listed at the bottom of the slide. If you want to know more, those go into way more detail. Sean, let's talk about the evolution of large language models, and this is an incredibly complicated slide, so boil it down for us. Yeah, I mean, honestly, to see it at this, this level of, of complexity is a little overwhelming, but what you'll see at the bottom is things like word to vec things that you may have heard about, you know, five years ago. Um, the, the very trunk of this tree is the beginning of this technology as it was evolving. The very tip of the tree is where we see GPT 3.5, some of the things that you hear about now, Llama, a lot of these models. There's a history to each of these. One of the most important things to note here is A, it's rapidly proliferating. Uh, so just last week, uh, Meta released a couple more models uh, that they call their Llama models, which is their Llama 2 model. The other thing to notice here is there's both open source models and closed source models. The closed source model is something like ChatGPT from OpenAI. You can't download that. You can't own their model. It's proprietary. They're running it on their servers. That's the only way it's going to run for the foreseeable future. Open source models you can download and run on your hardware. And uh, so, so that's a, a massive distinction. Now, Sean, you introduced me to this source. Where can you find open source models? Right. Uh, you, you'll see here the hugging face. We also had a, like a, a funny montage at the beginning that, that showed their logo. It's basically the public square where artificial intelligence uh, researchers are putting new models. So if you're curious to know what's new in AI, hugging face is the go-to source. So in a nutshell, an open AI system is a system I can literally, if I have a server big enough, download the system and start monkeying around with it myself. Right. And closed is no. You got to buy it, you got to license it, you got to... Or partner with the closed source provider. And if it's closed source and I send data, I'm not sending it to my box, I'm sending it to some server farm that somebody else owns. And frankly, that's one of the biggest client's concerns. Yeah. Okay, got it. All right, uh, MIT apparently has... Um, talked about this, but before we get to that, there's a certain exponential growth chart that uh, Laura found, and I'm shocked at it because I don't fully understand how it could be true. Tell us how this technology that we're talking about now has outpaced all the other technologies we thought could never be outpaced. Well, I mean, if you go back historically, it took a long time to get market penetration. It took a long time for 100 million people in the world to be doing something. 
Uh, for ChatGPT, it took two months. So within two months of them announcing that it was out, 100 million people worldwide were using it. So let's transition for a minute to the how question, how this might affect lawyers, and maybe start asking ourselves, why is the impact on lawyers uh, as grave as it appears to be? Uh, Laura, this is the MIT working paper, I think, that you found? Yes. Um, so as you know, most of what lawyers do day to day revolves around writing, and MIT researchers determined that writing productivity could be increased anywhere from 35 to 50 percent. Um, compare that to steam power and the Industrial Revolution, that only increased productivity by about 25 percent. So it's easy to see when you compare the two revolutions, how this could affect the legal profession significantly. And from practical experience, I think that estimate is, is conservative. Uh, we're already at 50% expecting a lot more than that. All right, so let's get a little more specific and turn to one of the largest law firms in the world, DLA Piper, and uh, a new development that's happened there that should inform some of our thinking. So DLA Piper is a multinational law firm, um, has 4,200 attorneys. Um, they just hired a chief data scientist this past March. His name's Bennett Borden. Before he went to law school, he was a data scientist for the CIA, using machine learning in the 1990s to predict human behavior. So this man has decades of experience with AI, and he has a lot to say about how AI could affect the legal profession. Usually he has a lot to say. Yes. We so what we need to think about is how do we take advantage of this technology without it disrupting how we do business? Got an issue here. Let me back that up and try that again. Okay. Take your time. Technical difficulties. Down into the left. Yep. Here almost there, yeah. He's basically just saying here that lawyers aren't going to be replaced by AI. Lawyers who use AI are going to replace lawyers who don't use AI. And I get that question all the time. Everyone says, hey, Sean, everyone tells me uh, I'm going to be replaced by AI. Am I going to be replaced by AI? And there's this you know, skeptic note, of course. Uh, and my answer is no, you're not going to be replaced by AI. You're going to be replaced by someone who's using AI because they're going to be more effective than you are uh, at your job because of that tool. So the, the legal profession, the takeaway from that for me is the legal profession is not competition oriented enough. It's going to get more competitive and this is going to be the competitive edge according to this data scientist. By the way, who among you at your law firms has a full-time CIA agent working as a data scientist for you? So, and they're spending millions of dollars on this whole thing, as we're going to find out in just a minute. Um, let's go, Laura, to the survey that LexisNexis did a couple of, of um, months ago. I think it tells us a lot about, particularly those of you who have corporate clients and uh, the sort of phone calls you might be getting in the next six months or so. Yeah, there was a LexisNexis survey this past March um, that demonstrates that 75% of the most sophisticated clients of large law firms in-house counsel expect to be made aware of the use of generative AI tools that the firm uses, and a majority expect to be given a choice about whether to use those tools. The way I read this survey, Laura, um, I don't know that any of the general counsel have any, any, any much more sophisticated understanding of this than any of us do at the present time, but they want to know, and they're coming to the lawyers asking. Is that the way you're understanding this survey as well? Yes, yeah. Sean, you're in a patent firm. You're obviously on the cutting edge of AI. Does this survey represent what you're seeing with your corporate clients? Without a doubt. So all of our clients are huge multinationals. Um, they have huge in-house legal departments. And they're coming to us saying, what are you doing with AI? What should we be doing with AI? And what are the risks and the opportunities? And they expect us to have answers to those questions. Let's go to the New York Times article. I thought that was pretty impactful. What are they telling us there, Laura? 
A lot of experts are predicting that generative AI is going to affect how law firms bill, um, particularly hourly billing. Um, DLA Piper's chief data scientist has also given some insight into how his firm is particularly tackling this issue. Hopefully this video plays. We must have had a, a copyright violation or something with a comment. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. What he is saying is pretty much what the New York Times article said, which is that, and if you think about this, those of you who you know, joined the profession earlier than last week, as you may know in many law firms, and in the firm I used to work in, you build by task. You didn't build by the hour. The billable by the hour model was brought in through the, the insurance defense industry and insurance defense firms into the mainline industry of most of the large firms. And as a consequence of that, obviously there's an economic incentive to bill more hours. Judge, let me, let me just ask a question. That, that as a younger lawyer, is surprising to me. Um, to me, it seems like from time immemorable, billing by the hour is the only way we can bill. But coming to the law firm where I'm at now, that's not a viable option, right? The, 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 the task is what matters. And as AI increases the efficiency, Sean, it seems to me that, as we're going to find out later, we might have some ethical questions we've got to ask ourselves. You know, if we can replicate the same level of work, particularly at the front end of a project, with an AI program that costs us, what, $400 a month by licensing, how could we possibly, you know, not do that? Um, let's talk a minute, Sean, about you've given a lot of thought to this, not only for your firm, but I'd like you to, to help all of us in the room that have a law firm to know, well, how can I fit into this? Because obviously we're not all DLA pipers. We don't have millions of dollars. We don't have, you know, chief science officers working for us. But it seems to me there are models, and you've discussed them with me, sure. With Let us. me have Laura Quick summarize some of the things that other firms are doing, and then I'll go to what we're doing, because I think, I think um, we're a little unique on this front. Um, so let's, let's sure. see what the main line is. Um, one of the biggest ones out there right now is Harvey. Allen and Overy has teamed up with Harvey, which is a legally trained version of OpenAI's GPT model. Um, they've been using it in-house for months. There's a 15,000 law firm wait list to use Harvey. Of which we're one. Very nice. Um, also, another AI tool that's out there is co-counsel. Um, some other big firms, DLA Piper, Kirkland and Ellis, Fisher Phillips, they're using that. That's produced by Case Text. Also, another legally trained version of OpenAI's GPT model. And I just had a, a conversation with co-counsel's sales for, uh, team last week uh, to do this presentation to get permission to, to show some of their materials. Um, it's been explosive for them. They saw this coming about a year ago, and they have an exclusive arrangement with uh, uh, okay. OpenAI to, to, to do certain chat GPT um, tasks with them. Because of that exclusive arrangement, Westlaw is going to have to buy uh, case text and their, their co-counsel product because they can't afford not to have it. So we can't buy or license ChatGPT or the, in an open AI format, but they already did that. Well, you can. Yeah, you can still do certain things with open AI, but you're not going to have uh, access to their models. Uh, you're going to be more of a consumer rather than a partner. So now co-counsel's using that, adding value to the, uh, siloing off the giant model to a legal model. Is that what I'm understanding? That's, that's right. Yes, their website says that they update daily their model with new federal and state authorities. Which is one of the big weaknesses in ChatGPT is, is time, time cutoffs. Let me pause there for a second. So when I look at ChatGPT or BARD or something, it's looking at the entire internet, right? And all these open source stuff that they can find? Close. It's, it's looking at a corpus that was curated at a point in time in the past that it learned from. So imagine it, it read the Encyclopedia Britannica, mm -hmm. and that's all it knows is everything about the Encyclopedia Britannica. So one thing that OpenAI is not open about is exactly what was it trained on. So we don't know exactly what it was trained on. But you can be sure it was Twitter and, and Facebook and all kinds of websites as well as you know open source books. I'm sure Shakespeare's in there. Uh, interestingly, anything after 2016 from the US Supreme Court is not in there. Wow. So from a lay perspective, I would guess the next chapter of this story is going to be 
AI becoming, coming home, so to speak, and specific, specially trained models are coming out, and that's what I take it Harvey is, Laura? Um, yes, they've legally trained Harvey, um, but also other firms are doing um, their own fine-tuned models, like Holland and Knight. I think there's a specifically regarding um, analyst analysis of credit agreements. Um, so, and I think, Sean, your firm is doing the same. Exactly. So if, if we could uh, take a look at um, what are the options, right? I mean, I think, I think one of the, the partners in my firm, that the big question is, what are my options? Uh, so what you see on this slide, and I uh, apologize if it's too small, but there, there's, there's three tiers, basically. The top tier is you come up with your own foundational model. That's great if you've got $100 million that you're going to invest. And honestly, in a winner's takes most high stakes game like this um, is going to be, I, uh, I don't rule that out as a possibility. The next layer down is, is fine tuning an existing model. Here we're talking thousands of dollars, not millions of dollars. And then the very bottom tier, I mean, the, the, the first shelf is doable by anyone, and that's prompt engineering. It's learning how to ask different models the right questions to come up with the, the, the answers you're looking for. Uh, one of the uh, one of the pioneers in, in this in this space, uh, his name's Andre Karpathy. He spoke at the uh, Microsoft uh, Developer Conference a few weeks ago. He said the model is trying to answer your question. If you want the right answer to your question, it doesn't presume that. It just comes up with the most likely answer to your question. So if you want it to give you the right answer, you have to ask it to give you the right answer. And so that is something that's not intuitive to all of us. Uh, learning how to ask the right questions is, is a huge part of making this work. You know, I've seen um, websites that even actually have programs that tell you and show you how to create the prompts for the large language models for any different discipline you're in. Correct. Wow. I've also seen job postings for prompt engineers. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. Our second career, right? <laughs> So, Sean, you're doing something very different, though, than uh, all of those. You sound like you're doing something uh, that may be the next generation. That box has something to do with it. Tell us what that is. Right. So we've already done the prompt engineering, right? Uh, the, the official position at, well, kind of, a, kind of the de facto position at our firm is every partner, every associate is using some form of language model to figure out how it works more than anything, to make sure we understand the technology. Um, that way we can inform others and we can make wise decisions ourselves. There's some data protection questions that we need to, to, to uh, discuss, but that's, that's a whole other question. Uh, not using it would be a fool's errand. The, that's the first level. Just break into that level and start using it. We have, uh, we're, we're well into level two where we're training our own models. What you see here is a box. This is actually an entirely self-contained AI in this machine. It can answer questions and you can fine tune it to be really, really good at a particular task. Um, this is a seven billion parameter model in here. OpenAI's ChatGPT is probably a couple hundred billion parameters. It's not a big enough model to be really great at everything, but it is a big enough model to be better than any human at one task. Can I interrupt there? So uh, this is what's been important to me the whole way through this conversation. Who needs to be, you know, studying Shakespeare or Ho Chi Minh or, or Facebook when we're doing our job? We just need a model that is as learned as possible in legal matters and the history of the law and, and the philosophy of law, right? I, I sort of agree with you. You need a little bit of that other literature for spice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes didn't come from you know, the, the law alone. So you're doing that now, and where are you, and where is your firm in the competitive struggle? Because the thesis here appears to be that uh, you're competing, as all law firms are competing, and if you get out on the edge of this AI, you'll, you'll win the competition. Honestly, uh, our goal has always been to be the go-to firm for our clients. You know, our clients are large enough that they have multiple law firms uh, for any question. So if we drop the ball, there's someone else standing in line. We are answering this question more thoroughly than any of our competitors at this point. Now, uh, that doesn't mean we, we can sit back. We have to experiment, we have to push the envelope, and we have to keep moving that forward because it's a rapidly evolving field. 
So one of the things about that box that's appealing, if I were a client, is I can come to you and say, Sean, I, I, I want to do this, sort of sketchy, a little bit nervous about this, but just tell me where my data is going. And if you say it's going in this box right next to my office, I'd be go, okay, don't take the box anywhere, just leave it there. <laughs> That's exactly right. So some of our clients, that is their, that is their position. It's like, uh, I do not want you, categorically, do not use OpenAI's ChatGPT. Don't do it. Uh, so if that's their position, then we can value add in that situation, even though, um, even though other firms probably can't. The last layer that, that we're doing that uh, is, is more on the, the higher end speculative side is in this really expensive space, uh, do we want to go there ourselves or do we want to partner with some other organizations to, to kind of create new products that don't exist in the legal market right now uh, that solve unmet needs? There's, there's pent up demands in areas that weren't economically feasible before. Do we want to go there and address that? So we're not going to go super deep into that discussion until we've mastered the second tier, uh, but it is definitely on the radar. And then in that second tier, um, Laura mentioned earlier something called co-counsel. I think you said Westlaw just bought them out. Uh, you've worked with that a little bit? So yeah, uh, we've got a demo here. Hopefully uh, we can play the demo, but go ahead and see if that'll work. The, the bottom line is you can open case text, and it's a lot like chatting with ChatGPT. They have this exclusive partnership that Westlaw is going to buy. Uh, if the deal goes through, I think it's still pending. What you see here is its skills. One of its skills is to do contract policy compliance. And so you take your contract, you upload it, and then you add some uh, policies that you want it to, to follow. So in this case, we're going to add in uh, a policy for, let's say, um, I forget what the first policy was that I typed in. Oh, yeah, confidentiality. So the interesting thing is you can, in natural language, in, in whatever way you want to describe it, ask the contract, does it comply with this policy? So you're basically talking with the computer saying, read this contract and answer my question. Yeah. And this is also in real time? Yeah, this is actually not sped up. So uh, I think I might have sped up my typing. That's the slow part of this demo. Mm -hmm. So um, the, uh, the interesting thing about this too is, is it doesn't matter what you upload. So in this case, I uploaded uh, co-counsel's own terms and conditions. So we'll see if the co-counsel terms and conditions agree with what, uh, what I hope they do. So you asked, is it fair? Can I terminate at will? Questions like that. Can I pay in 45 days? Now here what you see is I started a timer and it's thinking. It's reading the agreement. So we're 10 seconds in. It's not searching it's actually analyzing. And so we've got about a second every minute right now. And so it's gonna be analyzing this whole time. You definitely grab a cup of coffee and come back. So you've got like five or six different prompts or rules or policies, I think is the way it was. Right. And so it's going through the whole thing backward and forward, backward and forward a billion times saying, is this fair, is this clause fair? Right. I think one of the prompts I saw, tell me if I'm right, was are there any ambiguous terms? Correct. Oh my God. Uh, w w wouldn't it be great if uh, received this in the right way, transactional lawyers would ask that question before they come to us litigators. Um, they would solve a lot of problems. So what are we looking at now? When so what you're seeing here then is, is the output after that 28 minutes of thinking. And it said, okay, here's your policy. Here's what I've identified as differences between your policy and this contract. And here's a proposed edit to the contract. And so it goes through term clause by clause, policy by policy, and analyzes the contract. And you know, you'll see different things, like it's a little small to read, but uh, so hey, this doesn't say 45 what, days. When it says it was fair or not fair, it mentioned the arbitration clause. That caught right. my attention. Right. And then it said, you know, if you're going to arbitrate, you know, I thought that was fascinating. Now, it's and not a couple of times, that, right? It actually knows that arbitration has consequences, right. and it's great for low dollar amounts, but it may arguably be disadvantaged to one party or the other if it's a high dollar amount. Right, and it's also interesting. Sometimes it'll say, this clause isn't inconsistent with your policy, but if you wanted to bias it more towards your policy, you could edit it as follows. Yeah, and I think in Invisible Ink it says, this clause may seem clear to you, but litigators can turn this clause a couple different ways. <laughs> <laughs> and judges, by the way, I'm not talking about just you guys. <laughs>
Now, this is a program co-counsel that Westlaw just bought, so I take it it's going to actually be... Is buying. So, buying. actually, it's, it's, it's Westlaw's parent company uh, is buying uh, co-counsel. Thomson Reuters, yeah. So this is not a box that you put together in your own firm. You literally no. just license it. This is something you could you could buy today. You could license it from from Case Text today. In fact, their salesman about, was thrilled that I was talking about it. I think it's about like four hundred dollars a month, I believe, for an all access right. plan. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Well, we've talked quite a lot so far about the uh, emerging uh, technology and the edges of it. it. It to this point in in the discussion, it seems to me it affects principally. Uh, the large dollar cases, the mega firms, uh, the corporate council operations, the uh, IT world. Uh, but Laura, one of the things you have an interest in and you've been researching is how could this affect access to justice and issues that um, are more deeply part of our, our ethics, particularly in the state of Virginia? Sure. I don't think it's just for the rich clients and the big law firms. Um, I think there's a definite impact that generative AI can have on the access to justice movement. Um, as you know, low-income Americans have a lot of legal problems that don't get any or enough help. Um, it's been estimated about 50 million Americans fall in this low-income category, and about three-fourths of those have at least one legal problem, civil legal problem, a year. So as you can see, the, there's a great need, um, and it's out. It's greatly outweighed by the number of attorneys that can help. Um, and a lot of experts have opined that generative AI can fill the gap with access to justice. Um, and I just was thinking of a way to um, test this, and I put in a very simple test example in ChatGPT, a tenant demand letter. Landlord tenant issues are pretty common with low-income Americans. Um, and I asked it to create a template um, for the return of a security deposit using relevant Virginia law. And in about 40 seconds, it created a pretty good template for someone who can't afford an attorney to do this on their own. As you can see, there's some code references in there. I did double check all of those. They're accurate. The substance is accurate, not too shabby. So as an attorney, you're an attorney, someone asked you this question, you wouldn't feel bad giving them this work product. I would not feel bad giving them this work product, yeah. Interestingly to me, you didn't ask them to give you code sections and quotes, you just said Virginia law and it found the code section, the 45 day rule, et cetera? Correct, yeah. And this is available, GPT 3.5 is still free, right? No, it's four now. GPT four, three point five, or four are it's both still available. Free. Oh, free. Uh, yes, four three point five is free. Yeah, four is a subscribed version. But four is twenty dollars a month thing. Correct. And was this done on three point five or four? Um, I did it on both, and I got the exact same answer. Oh, well, forget so the twenty dollars. I think this video is forget. actually from GPT four, but. <laughs> All right, that's that's pretty doggone encouraging. I had uh, I, I hope Chip Nunley's in the audience. I had a conversation with a friend of mine, and a former colleague about uh, AI months ago. In fact, I mentioned it to you. And his heart and the heart of many in, in, in the group that he's with is with, you know, trying to have technology come to the aid of not just the wealthy, but the people who are sort of squeezed out of the system. So I, this is a very encouraging uh, development. And uh, I think we need to put a lot more attention on it, don't we? Yes. So let's now um, transition to a review of roughly the topic areas we think we can address with AI. And then those of us who are new to this, including me, uh, show me a, a list of places I can go and look at things and find them. And if there's any sort of tutorials, where would I go? Sure. Um, the next two slides, I have lists of legal specific AI tools, uh, Harvey, co-counsel, Spellbook. I want to pause on Spellbook. I actually signed up to be one of the first adopters of Spellbook, and I just got an email yesterday that there's 60,000 attorneys on the wait list. Um, so that one's a very popular one. It has really neat features in it, like finding conflicting terms and contracts. There's an explain it to a five-year-old feature, which is really intriguing to me. I like that feature. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who doesn't need that? Um, we also have um, uh, Kira's another contract one. On the next slide, I have... Uh, 
Lexis is going to have its own legal research AI, Lexis Plus AI, Clearbrief, Lex Machina. I also have um, some pro se sources like Do Not Pay, Ox. Um, and then there's also some, this is relevant to the access to justice point, LawDroid and Joseph, they have some no code. And Sean, can you explain what no code means? Absolutely. So a lot of these things, you, you imagine a data scientist in the back room crunching the numbers and, and, and you know, heads down with a box like this or 15,000 of them, whatever. Um, but they're not the experts, the, the subject matter experts on how these systems should work. And so they've made some low code or no code options where you're dragging and dropping connections, you're dragging and dropping boxes onto the screen. You're saying, okay, given this question, this is the type of discussion I want to have. And then you can get your people who know the most frequently asked questions, uh, so to speak, who can, who can train the model to, to give the right answers. That's creating the prompts for you. Right. I get it. So somebody with very little um, computer know-how could do this. Exactly. And uh, on the Access to Justice slide, I had a podcast linked on there, um, and it was between a legal aid director and the creators of LawDroid and Joseph, and they created LawDroid and Joseph basically to help with access to justice issues. And their vision is basically they can use these no-code sources to create bots that triage you know, clients legal needs as they come in or translation services, those sort of things. And triage is a great is a great thought, right? So a lot of people come in the door and they have a question, right? And they have no basis of knowledge. They don't even know what the right issues are. And so if you can if you can triage that and at least get the, the, the client up to speed to a certain level, uh, then they're asking the attorney if you do have a, a, a you know initial consultation with them more intelligent questions. And if you can use an AI chatbot to do that rather than an attorney, that saves a ton of time. Right. Where would I go to just learn how to even begin to use some of these tools? You put together some tutorials for us? Yes, this is just a small sampling of free resources online to educate yourself about AI. Um, there's a lot out there for free. It's a very hot topic right now, so everyone wants to get on the bandwagon. Um, but these are some of the sources that I thought were the most useful if you want to know how to practically use legal AI tools in your firm. All right, at this point in the uh, discussion, uh, Sean and Laura, um, the, the thing that occurs to me the most is there's a lot of potential here, but I feel a lot of need for caution, but I can't articulate exactly where that caution has got to show up. So what I thought I'd like to do at this point is just take some elementary thoughts these are just thoughts, these are not judicial opinions, of some pushback issues to bear in mind no matter what you're doing. So the first is our ethical codes. And you know, the, the big three, the big three C's, which is caution, or consideration, cons consultation, confidentiality, and communication. Let's start with um, competence, though. So we have a a rule of court that is an ethical principle that says we have to be competent. Competent at knowing the law, competent knowing the facts of our case. But we also have made it very clear in a, in a comment, you have to be competent with your technology. Uh, that is not, that's a fairly new development in the last decade in the ethical codes and it's pretty much in almost all of the model codes across the United States and it's in our state as well. The second thing that is important is communication. Now this gets a little dicey. Communication is obvious. You need to communicate fairly and faithfully and fully with your client. So does that mean you need to communicate about the possibility or the use of AI in a client's uh, affairs? Do you need to communicate, by the way, that you're not using AI and you could theoretically use AI and reduce the cost of the legal services, which raises another implication. You have a duty to only charge reasonable legal fees. Do you need to communicate the role of AI, if any, with your client vis-a-vis -vis the impact, if any, on the way that you're billing and the way that you're charging and the ultimate number? Obviously, there's no easy answer to any of that. I'm not offering any easy answers, but clearly you should be thinking about that. Confidentiality, we touched that earlier, Sean. It seems to me that of, 
of all the cautions I've heard about uh, AI, that's, one, that's at the top of the list. This is the one the clients are most worried about. So uh, one thing to be aware of is, is OpenAI, for instance, when you're chatting with the OpenAI, the baseline is they're using that data to train the next model. So everything you say could show up in a conversation the model has with someone else later. Uh, it won't attribute it to you, probably. Hopefully, it could. Uh, yeah, it's possible. Right? It's entirely possible. Well, Sean told me. He's like, no, 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 I didn't. Um, well, truthfully, now that you mentioned that, Sean, I have seen AI answers that says, well, so and so states da da da, right? Or Professor so and so has argued blah blah blah. So it's entirely up to the closed source model scientists whether they're using what you type in there. Uh, very similar to Google. Google learns from our, our queries, and a lot of that information is reused to train Google, but. The, the open AI uh, model is much more so. It's much more intelligent. It's understanding what you're asking it. So that's the big deal between closed and open models. We can't go to ChatGPT or open AI and say, Look, tell me whether you do this or not. They can say whatever they want to say. We just can't see it. We can't check. That's right. So uh, now to be fair, open AI has a mode where you can put it in private mode and it uh, doesn't, it says that it doesn't save your answers or your questions. The trust me mode. Right. <laughs> I've lived too long to do that. <laughs> um, so confidentiality from an ethical point of view is a, a very big deal and um, I won't say much more about it but it should concern you gravely because um, that would be one breach that could really be serious that would affect your career, affect the, the law firm and affect your client, most importantly. And I want to I temper that just a touch with, with this statement. Um, we're lawyers, we're used to high stakes games. And the standard is that we're using reasonable care. Uh, we're already trusting a lot of this data to data centers, which have you know, very good security policies and whatnot. So, so don't, don't shut it down without thinking about it, because I think that might be the opposite error. That's a good point. I mean, everything we type into Lexus or Westlaw. Correct. And if I'm you know, typing in, a, the issue in this case is blah, blah, blah. Right. You know, at a certain point, we don't have a choice but to trust some of these, you know, server farms. And so choosing who you trust is the point. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Let's uh, move, Laura, to the limitations issue. Um, we have also the limitation, in addition to ethical concerns, of these models uh, produce sometimes bizarre results, and their database, sure. their corpus is limited. Let's talk about that. I think the biggest thing is you need to know the parameters of the AI databases that you're using. So one of the big issues is knowledge cutoff dates. So for example, ChatGPT without plugins has a knowledge cutoff of September 2021. Um, Sean, can you explain how plugins help with that? Right. So they've introduced this idea knowing uh, that people are going to want to say, hey, ChatGPT, order me some groceries. Well, apparently you can do that now with a plugin. So there's, there's plugins that you add to ChatGPT that access the internet to do tasks for you or to do research for you. So now you can enable the news plugin in ChatGPT and say, hey, who won yesterday's football game? And it'll be able to look it up and get you the answer. Another limitation also is, you know, obviously hallucinations. Um, and I just wanted to point out that co-counsel, this is very intriguing to me, they claim they've trained their model not to guess and also to show its work with hyperlinked sources. So that could also be an improvement on the hallucination problem. I believe um, DLA Piper's chief data scientist estimated in their usage of co-counsel, they've only observed hallucinations about once with every 10,000 queries. That's a pretty good error rate. So the, the giant large language models are producing hallucinations. We're going to get to the one in New York in a minute. Uh, but as I understand the, the chief scientist at DLA Piper, he's basically saying, when you customize this to a particular task like law, you reduce almost infinitesimally. In fact, one in so many thousands better than yeah, me. One in 10,000, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My clerks are constantly telling me, you know, you're hallucinating that case, Judge. I, there's no such case that says that. I go, keep it looking. Exist. <laughs> Sometimes I say, well, soon there will be. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Sean, um, let's go to the, the question of um, fakes and deep fakes, and um, probably we should start, Laura, with the New York thing, because we've all read about that, that article. I think even Virginia Lawyer's Weekly mentioned before, it. Before, who's heard about this? The guy who, yeah. yeah. Yeah, everybody has heard of this guy. 
I mean, really ridiculous. He used ChatGPT to create a filing in the SDNY. It had six non-existent case citations in it. They sounded good. What was that? They said exactly what he wanted to say. Yes. Um, opposing counsel obviously pointed this out to the judge, who then issued a rule to show cause. Um, he then went back to ChatGPT and asked it, are these cases real? ChatGPT said, sure they are, and you can find them on Lexis and Westlaw. He then attached those responses to his affidavit along with fake opinion text that was generated by ChatGPT. Y'all know where this is going. He ended up being sanctioned. Him, his supervising attorney, his law firm. I don't know why he went back to ChatGPT. I always go back to the source for the, you know, did you lie to me? Uh, there's a, a Texas judge that responded, I, it appears to me, is that right? Yes, um, one of the first responses was a federal judge in Texas requires now mandatory um, certifications on all filings where you have to either say, I did not use AI to create this filing, or if I did, we've verified everything, a human has verified everything that's cited by generative AI. Um, and then other, a couple other federal judges have now since followed suit, so I think the trend is that a lot of judges and courts are now going to require this. And I think that the way to think about this is you filed it, you're responsible for it. If it was ghostwritten by your secretary or your uh, first year associate, you are still responsible for it. So check the work that, that you're responsible for, um, realizing that the the model can come up with a, with an erroneous idea just like just like someone in your office could. Right, that makes sense. Um, the concept of deep fakes. You mentioned that in the vocabulary lesson earlier, and you got an example of that, I think, Laura. I do. It's actually from 2019, so it was several years ago. But a uh, Dubai dad was in a custody case in the UK, and the mother produced evidence that had been doctored with the use of free online AI tools. She took a voicemail recording of the father and added words, violent threats that he did not say. And opposing the father's counsel discovered this by analyzing the metadata of the file, realizing she had doctored the file. So it's obviously with the advent of all these free online AI tools. It's something you're going to have to be aware of when it comes to evidence that's produced in court. So we, we thought about, as part of this presentation, doing, doing a demo of this. And uh, I actually demoed it to the team here. And uh, you can have a video camera looking at you. In my case, it was just my webcam. And I replaced my face with Ryan Reynolds in, the meeting, uh, in, in, in this meeting with, with the judge. And he said, well, Sean, you look better than usual. I'm like, yeah, it's look, true. Looking good, Sean. <laughs> looking really good. <laughs> Um, but, the, but the point of it is, in real time, it was taking my facial gestures, my communication, and making a well-known actor say those things as if he was saying it. Now, it wasn't perfect, but it will be undetectable to, to the average person before too many more months go by. It's, it's, it's accelerating that quickly. So the Dubai case raises some, some obvious evidentiary questions we're going to eventually have to sort out. Yes, there's um, obviously a lot of questions that need to be considered in regards to evidentiary admissibility with evidence generated by or manipulated by generative AI. Um, I have some resources at the bottom of this slide. Um, they're hyperlinked. They should be in the handout and the presentation that was distributed to everyone beforehand. Um, so you can look at these later, but those sources delve into these questions in depth. Let me, let me just put one pin in it so it's obvious to everyone. Who has ever, you know, thought about, hey, has this photo been doctored in Photoshop? Raise your hand. You're just wondering, right? Now you need to think about that with video, audio, or any other content because it can, the generative AI now is fast enough, whereas before it was cost prohibitive. You need an entire CGI department in order to doctor a video. It's too hard. Now you can do it on a laptop. Uh, using some of these Online. tools. So an Online. amateur can pull it up and do it. Easily. So you can't go to your client like you used to be able to say, stop you know, misleading me. We got a, there was a telephone call. This is what you said. Right. When they say, I didn't say that, we can't just say, well, you're lying. Because right. it's possible they didn't say it. That's true. Uh, I don't know how this is going to be sorted out in the courts. I really don't. I, I've been thinking about it to try to add value to this discussion. And I think this is going to be one of those 
uh, incremental approaches. We're going to need the bar and the bench to um, adjust some of our evidentiary uh, platforms to understand how to go about this. Do we pause a trial in the middle of a trial? Do we say, oh, that's ridiculous. Of course he said it. Obviously, that's not a good idea. Authenticity idea. is now a massive question. Yeah. Um, one of the cautions that also occurred to me is that need for at least there to be some sort of policy in every law office so that, you know, the young tech-savvy person's not doing something that the uh, management doesn't want to happen, or if you ever get a discovery request or, God forbid, a disciplinary issue, you want to be able to say, we've thought this through, we've got some rules. Uh, Laura, you've given us some uh, examples of policies generally, is that right? Yes, these are just like frameworks for creating a policy, and they're not legal specific necessarily, it's for all businesses, but it's a pretty good starting point if you don't know where to start and to create a policy for your law firm. And no doubt you and your firm have that. Absolutely. You have to uh, have a balanced policy, one that protects your clients, that's, that's the essential feature, mm -hmm. and also one that enables you to give your clients as much value as possible, because that's expected. So 15,000 law firms in the United States signed up for Harvey, just one thing, thousands for co-counsel and the others. You're Firms like you are building your own AI platforms. Uh, we obviously need policies for everything. We've gotten to the point, in, at least for me in this discussion, that the first two questions are not too hard to answer at the moment. The first question was, why are we talking about this? I think it's, this is an obvious answer, because this is, to summarize the professor, this is a really big deal. It is going to change a lot. We've, we'd be foolish not to take this as a serious question. The second question though, the how question, you know, how is it really going to affect us day to day, practically speaking? I'm not sure there's a clear answer to that. I, I really don't know. And the final question uh, is, what do we do about it? <laughs> what do you do about it? You're gonna walk out of this meeting and you're gonna go talk hopefully with your management committee of your firm and someone's gonna say, well, what do you want me to do? We have a lot of work to do, Judge. I, th I think that's right. Let's, let's just leave it there. We have a lot of work to do. Sean and Laura, you've both done extraordinarily good work. We really appreciate it. Let's, let's give them a hand.